I invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn today to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. We are continuing our study called Just Jesus. We've been in the Gospel of Luke for the entire year. We're wrapping up as we hit Christmas season. So we're going to be in Luke 1. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1016 and you will find the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. And if you don't have a Bible and you want to read the Bible, then take one of these with you. It is our gift to you. And we want you to have God's Word, read God's Word, because we know if you do that, it will change your life. Hey, while you're finding Luke chapter 1, let me tell you about something I'm really excited about. Well, I also moved this microphone because I'll bump into it if I don't. Uh, Something I'm really excited about is after the first of the year, we're doing Purpose Driven Life as a church, wide emphasis, and we want you to participate in that. And uh, you can go online right now at calvarylhc.com and sign up to be in a life group, whether that is an ongoing life group, whether that is a purpose-driven life group that's going to meet for seven weeks. Uh, We even have a life group that's going to meet here on Thursday nights because we know some of you are not going to go to somebody's house you don't know and go there because that's just like totally freaking you out, the thought of it. You know, social anxiety is real. And so... uh, And so we've got options for you because we want you to participate because we know if you participate that God can change your life. And uh, if you're like me, then you need God to change your life. You need God to work in your life. You want him there uh, to be a part of it. So I'm just challenging you. uh, If uh, if you want God to grow you in 2017, sign up. Be be part of Purpose Driven Life. You don't want to sign up online, that's fine. Next week we're going to have sign-ups here. We're going to have the books available, uh, all of that for you. So uh, I'm excited about that. I hope you're excited because uh, it is a life-changing opportunity. The writer of Hebrews declares, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For anyone who comes to God must believe that He exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. I'm going to ask you a totally unfair question. How many of you here today really want to live a life of faith? Yeah, see, hands go up all over. It's, yeah, we're in church. People are like, yeah, I'm all for faith. I'll do the faith thing. I, you know, and everybody's for faith. I don't even, even outside of church, you ask people, hey, are you for faith? And they're going to go, yeah, I'm all for faith. Don't tell me what, yeah, but just, yeah, I'm for faith. It, it's like we, we want to live a life of faith. It's a great church answer, but it's also a dangerous one. And here's why. Faith is developed in the crucibles of life. In other words, God uses the painful and the difficult times in our lives to build our faith. Times of struggle, times of loss, times of tragedy, times of heartbreak. He uses those to refine us and strengthen us and develop faith in our lives lives. So when we say we want to be people of faith, we want God to increase our faith, we want to live a life of faith, then we're embracing that crucible that faith is developed in. Because let's, let's be honest, it doesn't require much faith when everything's going well, does it? I mean, if you're happy and you got money in the bank and your spouse thinks you're wonderful and your kids are not messing up, then, you know, you're like, hey, yeah, I, I got faith, this is good. That's the easy part. But in times of struggle, that's when our faith is revealed. That's when our faith is tested. That's when our faith is developed by God. That's why the Apostle James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, says this. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. It's not usually my initial reaction when stuff goes wrong in my life. I don't know about you. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result that you might be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Faith. Faith is developed in the crucibles of life. And Christmas is the story of great faith. And hear that again. Christmas is a story of faith that is amazing. It's about this young woman who dared to trust God and obey in a radical way. And so today we're going to look at Christmas faith, but if we're going to do that, we've got to flush some assumptions we may have about Christmas. First of all, Christmas is not this sweet, sentimental, Hallmark Channel Christmas movie kind of thing. Okay, let's just go ahead and confess a little bit. How many of you love those, you know, Hallmark Channel Christmas movies? Yeah, so does my wife. Uh... 
which is why I praise God that we have two t televisions in our house. Uh, it, th that's not the Christmas faith that we're talking about. Christmas I is not really the sentimental journey of joy. It's not this idyllic setting, you know, uh, where everything is all perfect and wonderful and joyful. If you get right down to being biblical, the Christmas story is a blood and guts battle that includes tragedy and fear and betrayal and disappointment and courage. In fact, the best depiction I think I've seen uh, on film is this uh, movie that was made about 10 years ago called The Nativity Story. And if you've got kids at home or grandkids that are coming over, watch The Nativity Story with them. It is, it's a, a really excellent portrayal of what it, it probably was like, and it's mostly biblical. Uh, you watch it. If you can't figure out what's not biblical, then come see me. We'll talk about it. Uh, but it's not a big deal even on that. So today we want to look at Mary's story of Christmas faith. Luke chapter 1. Beginning in verse 26, I invite you to follow along as I read. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now this is an amazing story. And I want to talk about Christmas faith, but before I even dive into the message, let me just say something. I, I love that statement that the angel makes to Mary, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. And if you don't hear anything else I say today, maybe you should hear this. Nothing is impossible with God, which means no matter how broken your life is, no matter how deep in depression you are, no matter how much you're struggling right now, no matter how sick you are or how uh, you know, dysfunctional your family is, God can change your life. You might think you're beyond hope, but you are not because nothing is impossible with God. And so as we look at Christmas faith, the first thing I want you to see is that Mary was given an impossible assignment. An impossible assignment. Mary, you're going to be the mother of Messiah. A uh, little problem here, and she names it in verse 34. How can this be? Since I am a virgin. Uh, she's young, but she knows how things work, and if she hasn't been with a guy, she knows she can't have a baby. And, of course, the angel gives her the solution. The power of God's going to come over you. The Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. And you're going to have a baby. It's a miracle. He's going to be called the Son of the Most High. It's all good because that's what God does. Nothing is impossible with God. Here's the thing. God loves to give his people impossible assignments. He does it all the time in the Bible. By the way, we want you to read the Bible because when you read the Bible, you start understanding how God works in life, in other people's lives, and you begin to understand how he's working in your life. So let me just give you some examples of people in Scripture that God asked to do the impossible. There was this guy named Noah. You guys heard of him? Uh, you can read his story in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. So Noah, there he is, you know, living a life, and God says, I want you to build a boat. And Noah's like, okay, what's a boat? Well, build an ark. All right, what's an ark? All right, you don't know what an ark is. I can't explain it because you don't have this concept in your mind. So here's just the dimensions. Build this. And by the way, Noah, uh, you're going to be a temporary zookeeper as well. Okay, God, I'd ask you what a zookeeper is, but I know you're not going to tell me anyway. So, uh, you know, he, but he, he did that. It, you know, it, crazy task. There was this guy named Moses 
Moses led the, the children of Israel out of slavery, out of Egypt, and he was 80 years old when God came to him and said, Moses, I want you to do this. And Moses is like, I'm old. Um, they want, I'm wanted for murder in Egypt, and I mentioned I'm old, and uh, I can't speak so well. And God says, yeah, I made you. It's okay. I'll take care of that, and I want you to go and do this, an impossible assignment. You want to read about that? Book of Exodus, great read, great story. Or how about this guy named David? King David, he wasn't a king, he was just a shepherd boy, and he shows up at the battlefield not to fight, but to bring supplies. That's how important he was. He was just bringing food for his brothers who were in the army. This is in 1 Samuel 17, if you want to read it. And he gets there, and uh, there's this giant that's challenging everybody, and God kind of leads David to go and kill the giant. That's an impossible task for a boy, isn't it? Not a problem with God. Or how about the disciples? Story in Luke chapter 9, there's a crowd gathered around Jesus. They're out in the middle of nowhere. They've been there all day long, and the disciples are like, hey, Jesus, you better send them away so they can go home before it gets dark and get something to eat. And Jesus gives them an impossible assignment. What does he ask them to do? You guys feed them. What? We don't have food. We don't even have money to buy food. If we could buy food, what are you talking about? You see, God loves to give his people impossible assignments. And my guess is that God is asking you to do something that you think is impossible right now. God is asking you to do something that you think is impossible. It, it, it may be something that is a biblical command. Maybe you've been you know, taking our challenge to read the Bible and you've been reading it and God's been kind of telling you, hey, you need to stop doing this. You need to start doing this. And you're like, I can't do that. You think it's impossible. Or maybe it's, it, it's God giving you a task and God wants you to serve in some way. Maybe he wants you to lead a life group. Maybe he wants to participate in this purpose-driven life. Maybe he wants you to lead it. Maybe he wants you to you know, work with kids. Or maybe he wants you to go to Peach Springs this afternoon uh, and hand out Christmas gift bags to hundreds of kids. And you think, I can't do that. Mary's story demonstrates our choice. We can either focus on our limitations or we can focus on God's power. So what are you focusing on? Because God gave Mary an impossible task and she focused on God's power. And because she did that, God used her in a mighty way. Christmas is the story of God's miraculous power in our lives. So God loves to give people an impossible assignment. He gave Mary an impossible assignment, and Mary accepted great risk. Now, Scripture tells us that Mary was engaged to Joseph. Only the real word is betrothed, and it means so much more than, hey, here's a ring, will you marry me, kind of thing. It was a contract where the two families had agreed, and, and Mary and Joseph had agreed, and they'd entered into a relationship where it was exclusive, and, and it was legal, and it was binding, and, and, uh, and she was sitting there talking to the angel, saying, hey, how am I going to have a baby? I'm a virgin. And, uh, and he explains, this miracle is going to happen, and now Mary has to explain it to Joseph. How do you think that went over, huh? Because he knows... The baby isn't his. He knows the baby isn't his. Uh, so how's he going to respond? All right, let me just ask you guys, how are you going to respond? You're engaged. Your fiancé comes up to you and says, hey, I'm having a baby, but it's okay. It's God's. Yeah, see, you, you guys are, see, Joseph, she didn't know. Is Joseph going to divorce her? Is he going to execute her? Is he going to shame her? Is it going to be bad? She doesn't have a clue. And we read the story, and we think Christmas, oh, you know, uh, we know how it ends, so we don't get all bent out of shape about it. But Mary didn't know how the story was going to end. She took the risk. Now, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1 tells us what Joseph went through. In fact, when Joseph found out that Mary was with child, he decided, since he was a good guy, that he was going to divorce her quietly instead of having her executed. Now, in, you know... 2016 America, having a, a child out of wedlock is no big deal, but in first century Palestine, that would have meant that she would have been uh, uh, 
full of shame her whole life. She would have been kicked out of her own family. She would have been, uh, you know, just counted as trash. She would have had really no options. Jesus would have been illegitimate. Uh, all that stuff. This is a horrible outcome. And, and, and so Joseph planned to divorce Mary until the angel showed up. And he said to Joseph, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit and she will give birth to a son and you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And Joseph woke up from his dream and said, okay, I'm going to marry, uh, marry her and we're going to be a family. But I want you to see this. Faith requires courage. Faith requires courage. If we're going to follow Jesus, it will require us to make courageous decisions to trust God. It's not going to be easy to follow Christ. And a lot of times we mistakenly believe that God would never ask us to do something dangerous or risky. I don't know why we think that, but a lot of times we do. I've even seen, you know, uh, these, you know, Christian posters or little, you know, things with this on it or memes on Facebook. You know, God will, you know, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. The safest place to be is in the center of God's will. And I think when I read that, who are they talking about? Have they ever read the Bible? Because, just so you guys know, sometimes bad stuff happens to people who are in the middle of God's will. Like maybe Jesus Right, do you know what Jesus said to us? Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he said, If any of you is going to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And we're so comfortable with that that we just say it and don't think about it. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, it means you have to deny yourself. Okay, I've got to stop doing some stuff I don't, I don't want to, you know, that God doesn't want me to do. Take up an implement of torture and death every day and follow Jesus. Where did Jesus end up with that cross? Dying. You guys, you know that's how the story ends, right? Jesus died. He was in the center of the Father's will. In fact, he prayed, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. And it was God's will that Jesus would die. You go, well, yeah, but that's Jesus. That's not me. Really, how about the followers of Jesus? How about the 12 guys that were the apostles? Not counting Judas, because they elected a replacement, a guy named Matthias. And, uh, and so there's these 12 guys. What happened to them? These are devoted followers of Jesus. And 11 of the 12 died horrible, gruesome, torturous deaths. Yay! You're like, well, maybe I could be like the 12th guy. Oh, you want to be like the Apostle John? Sure. The Apostle John, he spent the last decade or so of his life exiled on an island in prison. You see, following God requires risk. Risk. Maybe... That's why God keeps telling us, do not be afraid. In fact, you know the, the message that is most consistent throughout all the Christmas accounts in the Gospels is that statement, do not be afraid. The angel shows up to Mary, and what does he tell her? Do not be afraid. Angel shows up to J Joseph, he says, do not be afraid. Angel shows up to the shepherds on the hillside, what does he say? Fear not. I bring you good news of great joy, but stop being afraid in the process. Because he knows, God knows how much fear drives our lives. And he wants to tell us, don't be afraid. Go ahead and accept the risk it takes to follow me. By the way, we all do risky stuff all the time. We just don't really think about it being risky. Uh, let me just illustrate this. How many of you have ever eaten in a restaurant? Yeah, a lot of you didn't raise your hands, but you have. I know it. I've seen you there. Yeah, we eat at restaurants. Guess what? When I was a teenager, I worked in restaurants. You eat in a restaurant, it's risky. Okay, you know. How many of you have eaten in, like, third world restaurants? Yeah, that's really risky. You've got nothing to complain about when it comes to faith. How about this one? How many of you have ever put up Christmas lights? Yeah, that's crazy risky, isn't it? Can't quite reach that one. Here, I'll lean off the ladder this way. Ladder won't reach. I need a bigger ladder. Ah, never mind. I'll just put it on a table. <laughs> Crazy risky. How about the riskiest thing of all? How many of you drove to church today? Yeah, see, you get in a car, you drive on the road, you are not in control of anything but yourself. You know, there's all these other crazy people out there driving around. Some of them are parked next to you in the church parking lot. It's okay. Uh, and, uh, 
You know, but you're, you drive and you don't control, you know, other people. You don't even control your car all the time because stuff can happen to it. It can be out of control. And yet we're willing to take that risk. For the record, everything God asks us to do involves risk. Everything. Trusting Jesus to save us from our sins, to forgive us and give us eternal life, that takes risk because you're saying, God, I believe you, I trust you, I, I, will, I will follow you. Or how about following God's crazy commands? You read the Bible and there's lots of his commands that don't make any sense, and yet Jesus expects us to trust him, take the risk, and, and do them. How about this one? You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's crazy. But God's saying, do it and it'll change your life and it'll change this world. Trust me. Or how about this one? If any of you wants to be great, he must be the servant of everyone. Well, I don't, I don't want to be the servant. I want to be served. I like people to take care of me and do all that kind of stuff. Not if you want to be great. Not according to Jesus. And you've got to be a servant. Or how about this one? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus said that. We're like, yeah, well, you know, I don't mind giving, you know, a couple times a year, doing, you know, some generous stuff and things. No, he's talking about a lifestyle that is devoted to giving away rather than to getting. Well, that's kind of crazy. How do I do that? You take a risk. You believe Jesus. You focus your life differently. Or how about this? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Um, how many of your sins did Jesus forgive when, when he died on the cross? All of them. Jesus forgave all your sins. If you're sitting here and you believe in Jesus, all your sins, all of your sins are forgiven. So um, let me get this straight. If we're supposed to forgive others in the same way that God forgave us in Christ, how many of other people's sins are you supposed to forgive? Yeah, you guys were a lot less enthusiastic with that answer. <laughs> it's always like, yeah, Jesus forgave all my sins i got to forgive all your sins, too. Um, but that's reality, and that's risky because we don't want to do that. There's some stuff we want to hold on to and keep it in store against somebody. You see, if there's no risk, there's no need for faith. So Mary was given an impossible assignment. Mary accepted great risk, and Mary submitted to God's plan. Did you catch this in verse 38? I love this. Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That's an amazing declaration of faith. I'm yours. I will do whatever you ask, God. Even though Mary didn't fully understand God's plans, she trusted God and believed that God's plans were better for her than her plans. First of all, are you a servant of the Lord? Have, have you experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you come to that place in your life where you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world? That you believe that He died on the cross to pay for your sins? That He was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life? You can't really say you're a servant of the Lord until you've done that. Until you've taken that step, until you've risked it all to say, Jesus, I need you to save me, to take me to heaven, to forgive my sins. Have you done that? If the answer is yes, you've done that, then do you believe that God's plans for you are better than your plans for you? Now see, this is one of those big faith questions. In fact, I'm convinced this is why we ignore God's directions for our lives in Scripture. Because we read Scripture and we understand what God wants us to do, and then when it comes to life, we honestly believe that our way is going to work better than God's way, and our plans are better than God's plans for us, and so we kind of contradict God's plans, and we live life our way, and how does that work out for us? Hey, look, I know every time in my life that I choose to do it my way instead of God's way, it crashes and burns. And I got to come back to God and I got to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and I want to do it your way because your way is better than my way. God's way really is better than our way, and yet we struggle to believe that. We struggle to live that out. 
But if you believe that God's plans are better, you will submit to his plans. You will follow his requests. And this is an act of faith that requires risk because in the midst of it, I don't care what it is, in the midst of it, if you're following God, you're going to feel like, hey God, where are you? What are you doing? How's this going to work out? Because I don't think it's, it, this is the way, isn't the way I imagined it being when I said I would follow you. You know one of the interesting things in Scripture? It tells us that Joseph at first responded and said, I'm going to divorce Mary. It doesn't tell us how long from the time that he found out that Mary was pregnant to where he said, I will marry you, that she had to wait. See, you, you read those lines in Scripture and it seems like, ah, it's just like that. But we don't know. It might have been a day, it might have been a week, it might have been a month. She might have agonized, crying out to God, God, what are you doing? I'm going to be, you know, a, a single mom and in a world that doesn't accept that. She trusted even when she couldn't see. Because if you keep following God, he's, it's going to amaze you how much he blesses you and leads you. So I'm going to ask you a question that I, I think will probably haunt you way beyond this service. Um, because it's one that I think God is asking us all the time. What are you not willing to do for God? What are you not willing to do for God? Uh, Mary said, may it be to me as you have said, according to your word. Mary risked her life, she risked her reputation, she risked her family to submit to God, and God used her greatly. We are still living in the blessings of her obedience. So what are you not willing to do in following Jesus? Because this is where faith becomes real. Are you willing to forgive? We've already talked about the totality of forgiveness. God has forgiven us co totally, and he's wondering, are we going to embrace that? Are we going to forgive? Are we going to forgive our parents? Are we going to forgive our siblings? Are we going to forgive our children? Are you going to forgive that, you know, former boss that was a jerk? How about this one? Are you going to forgive your ex? You see, this is where faith becomes real. Are we going to forgive? Are, are, are you going to serve? Maybe to lead a life group. Maybe to help with kids ministry. Maybe to volunteer and go to Peach Springs today. Maybe to, uh, you know, serve in some capacity. Whatever God wants you to do. You want to. Are you willing to do that if God asks you to do it? Are you willing to give? So this is where a lot of people's faith really struggles. I, I, look, I, I understand this. This is an obstacle for lots of people who are following Jesus. And, and it's because it's as simple as this. God asks us, his followers, doesn't ask anybody else. He asks his followers to give him 10% of their income. It's called a tithe. And God asks us to give him 10% to demonstrate our faith in him, that he's going to provide for us, he's going to take care of us, and that he is God and we are his, and we're going to submit our lives to him. And some of you are going, that's an impossible thing for me. Now, we already talked about God doesn't mind asking us to do the impossible. And if you're someone who struggles with that, and you're like, I can't do it, there's no way, then take baby steps, get there somehow, uh, look at what you've given to God in this last year, and, and then kind of go, all right, God, I'm going to increase that, and I'm going to give so much each month or each week or however you need to do it in, in your life for it to be routine, and see how God blesses you. And every so often revisit that and say, okay, God's blessing, I can give more. And start that journey towards that faithful amount that God's asking you to give. Because what are you not willing to do for God? Are you willing to share your faith? Share your faith. You know, lead your, your friends, your family, your coworkers into this life-changing relationship with Jesus. It's really as simple as just saying, hey, I, I know some people who don't go to church, and I'm going to invite them to come with me. I mean, if God is changing your life, then God can change their life. Remember, nothing is impossible with God. And by the way, I, I just read this recently, and I, I think we all know it anyway. The Christmas season is the time of year more unchurched people are open to going to church than any other season of the year. And Christmas Eve, specifically, is the number one service attended by people who don't go to church any other time. 
In other words, you've got family, you've got friends, you've got coworkers, you've got people around you that you know, and if you invite them to come with you to one of the four services on Christmas Eve, there's a good chance that they'll say yes. There's a good chance that'll happen. Will you take that seriously? What are you not willing to do for God? Because that's a question of faith. Your relationship with Jesus, your purpose, your joy in life will only go as far as your faith takes it. Today, I am praying that you have Christmas faith. Will you pray with me?